today's message, Put Off Destructive, Put On Constructive, part of the Put Off, Put On sermon series, was given by Pastor Alan Galloway at First Christian Church on June 11, 2023. How many Jenga fans? Hands up real high, real high, Jenga fans. I was going to actually bring a set to do it. Oh, okay. Now, those of you raised your hands, how many of you are Jenga fans and you just notoriously Go for those bottom ones because you want to see how fast can this thing come tumbling down. A couple hands. All right, a couple honest people. That's great. Well, I was thinking about Jenga this week, and in fact, it was a great picture of where we are going with this last message in our Ephesians. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 4. We've been camping out here for the last few weeks, and the picture today is that with our words, we can bring things down, like Jenga, or we can build others up. And so I'm excited this last message in the series. In fact, next week, uh, I want to come back, Father's Day. A good friend of mine is coming. He's going to lead us uh, in a great message. And then the next week is our Members Sunday. You see in our digital newsletter, we have actually budget information for those of you members. We'll be voting uh, on that uh, the last Sunday in June as our custom. But before we get too far out ahead, Let's just look at this passage in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to look at the last few verses, verses 29 through 32. So just follow along and highlight some things, underline some things, maybe make some notes or some questions that pop out for you from the text. And uh, let's dig into those. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, from with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. In other words, let's put off some things, as we've been talking about, uh, and today put off the words that bring others down, and let's put on words that build others up. Father in heaven, we have a desire to follow you, Jesus, to be shepherded by you, and today, Lord, that you would truly shepherd each and every one of us, that your word would be alive, active in our hearts and minds. Jesus, that you would lead us into places uh, that are meant for life, Let your word be life to us today, in Christ's name. All God's people said, amen, amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, we are going to conclude this message today, as I said, and I want to kind of begin with just a little bit of an IQ test, all right? IQ test, not an intelligent, but an uh, irritability quotient. Just as soon as I said that word, some of you just got a little like, uh, right? Uh, yep, amen. Uh, all right, irritability test. So here's what we're going to do is on a scale from one to five, I'm going to read a phrase, a situation, and you're going to give yourself a score. Now, this is just between you, Jesus, and the person sitting next to you. Um, and you're going to be honest with yourself, right? Church, good place to be honest. And you're going to give yourself a one. It's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's no big deal for me. That's not an issue. Or five, it's like, oh, it's, it's on, like Donkey Kong. I mean, I'm just like ready to blow up. Uh, I'm going to, you know, just lose it. I've been triggered by this, this situation. Okay, everybody ready? Five is a high score. Give yourself five. One's a low score. All right, and we'll add them up at the end. Okay, question number one, situation number one. You're in an intense conversation with someone, and this other person is not answering you because their face is firmly planted in a screen. One to five. Is that, how do you feel, right? Is that like, ah, it's not a big deal, it's kind of normal. Five, it's like, oh, I'm losing it. Listen to me with your eyes, right? Okay, number two. You're with a group of people, and someone in the group is pretending to be somebody that they're not, and you know that's not who they are. What do you do? How do you respond? Is it a one, two, no big, five, where are you at? Question number three. They talk, uh, you're uh, with a group of friends at dinner, and a topic comes up that you know a lot about. You've studied this. I mean, you really have this understanding of this field. And someone begins to share and talk like they are an expert in the field, and you immediately know they've got no clue what they're talking about. 
How do you respond? It's like, ah, just go ahead and yeah, yeah, just nod and wave, right? Uh, or do you just, you're like, oh, that's not it, that's not right. Okay, one or five, all right? I've got all kinds of these. I could go all day, all right? Number four, you are working with a group of people, you're on a team project, and someone makes a significant error on the project, and they blame you in front of everybody. What do you do? Five? <laughs> I heard a five immediately. Boom, okay, that's done. No way. All right. All right. Last one. Last one. You're driving. <laughs> and you're late. Oh, man. I don't even know you go farther, right? Car in front of you is going 20 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone, and there's no one around, and there's no way you can pass. How are you feeling? <laughs> one or five. All right. Any fives? Anybody like five? It's like, I'm just Mr. Chill. Yeah, so I just go with the flow. A couple? Really? It's 25s. Here, who's who's going to join me in the 25 group? Amen. Bless you. Bless your heart. I'm with you. Right? Oh, hey, I, I got to be honest. I am not very excited to preach this message. I'm seeing how much I can drag out from beginning and preaching it. The elders are forcing me to do it. <laughs> that was a five for me. Honestly, honestly, though, is I recognize my personal high score, which is not a good thing when it comes to these irritability situations. And maybe you're like that, too. And that's why I think Ephesians is so powerful. Ephesians is calling us, as we've been talking about, put off the old, put off old thinking, put off old attitudes. Today, put off some old language, language that's destructive, like that Jenga game, right? Just pulling out and being destructive. And put on speech, new speech, that is constructive, that builds others up, that is, that's helpful to them. In fact, this is such a significant theme throughout the scriptures, but I love how Ephesians just so perfectly speaks this language of uh, old and living in the new. But it always brings a question to me, like, why is it so hard to put off the old? Even when I say, oh, I'm going to change. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. Does anybody do that? It's like, oh, I'm going to be better. I'm just going to do it. It's like the sheer willpower thing. If I just white knuckle this long enough, something's going to happen. Which in my life, little ever happens that way. <laughs> and I think it's because there's a deep truth that you and I must move beyond willpower to weigh power. We need the way of Jesus forming deep within us, deep in our heart. And so I want to give you a little bit of a framework today, a helpful framework, some just kind of anchor points as you want to live out the scriptures. This week we're going to do some painting in here, so we'll have some scaffolding up to do that. And so I want to maybe give you some scaffolding to and anchor that scaffolding as you kind of move forward in the next several days, move out this week and wanting to live the scripture. And the first anchor point really comes from Jesus. Who better, right? The cornerstone, right? Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good man brings out good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings out evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, Jesus said, when your heart changes, your speech follows. It's a deep matter. It's a deep matter of the heart. Uh, uh, Think about it this way. You say something racist. You say something sexist, right? And then you follow, oh, I was just kidding. Just kidding. I, was just, I didn't mean that. Now, granted, you may not have meant that, but here's the truth. That was in your heart. That's in you, right? And it's how easy this is. we can be deceived, as we read a few weeks ago, about the culture and where we are within the culture, right? Maybe you didn't mean it, but it was deep in your heart. Maybe you've said something like this. I've done this. I wish I had like a, a net where I could sometimes catch my words. It's like I say something. It's like, oh, where'd that come from? Right? Who said that? Did I say that? I didn't say that. It's like, oh, man, if I could just grab that and bring that right back. Or maybe you've said something like this to yourself. It's like, come out of a conversation, you think, why did I feel like I had to kind of exaggerate in that conversation? Why did I feel like I had to spin you know, situation, the truth there. And this is what we're talking about, getting to this deep place, this deep heart. So this is the idea, is this, this idea that my speech is stored up within my heart, the deep 
places of my heart. That's like the first anchor point, what Jesus is saying. Here's the second one, is our speech is also a barometer. Speech is a barometer for your spiritual maturity. Sometimes we think there's all kinds of things that kind of give us an understanding of this is my spiritual quotient, this is my spiritual understanding, the depth of what I know. But really, my speech, it's the biggest barometer, right? Some of you who are in our encouragers class, right? Hey, if you're looking for a group of people to get to know, uh, we have a group that meets Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Uh, they've got space, right, Bart? Right? He'll be recruiting you after the end of the service. Uh, and they're a fantastic group, and they're actually going through James, and we're going to see James, a lot of James today. James chapter 3, verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is, a, is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Perfect. I usually think that I'm perfect. Well, that, well, perfect doesn't mean without sin, which is often what we think of. Jesus was perfect, and Jesus was without sin. But when James speaks to this idea of being perfect, he's actually saying mature. In other words, we could read it this way. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is mature. They have a spiritual maturity within them, able to keep their whole body in check, right? In other words, we could say it like this. I become a master of speech... I will truly be set apart from many others. We, get, we do something that most have a lot of difficulty accomplishing. All of us, a reminder, all of us need the Holy Spirit power at work within us. Right now, I'm actually praying as I'm speaking to you, God, help me not to say something stupid. Proverbs is another great passage. Many times as you're reading James, you're reading Proverbs as well. Proverbs 18.4 says this, the words of the mouth are what? Say it aloud deep waters but the fountain of wisdom is a rushing stream in other words we take stock of our words we take stock of the words that we speak we even take stock of the words often that are spoken to us spoken about us spoken over us i mean these are deep issues deep issues of the heart now that doesn't necessarily mean deep intellectually doesn't mean deep philosophically but it's true that it is a deep reservoir a deep place from where those words the words that we speak come from in fact, how many of you grew up reciting this little adage? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, well, what? That's just a lie. Right? I mean, it is. If you think about it here, that, that's just not true. I've got some words I'm recognizing spoken to me, about me, from a very young age that still have a way of haunting me. And maybe you do too. Some, in fact, there are people out there, they are just marksmen with their words. They can get out like a thousand yards and just fire off a little word and bing, hit the bullseye every time. Just, just perfect at it. That perfect word that just destroys. Or some, maybe you're like this, I'm just a carpet bomber, right? I just come through and just boom, 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 boom with all my words, just dropping bombs everywhere. And I leave a mass destruction in my wake. Here's the truth. All of us have experienced the sharp residual effects of words that have been spoken to us and left marks in our back. Ouch, that hurt, right? And if we're honest, all of us have contributed to some of those sharp words, those sharp jabs. If you think about it, sometimes a careless word spoken from a mentor, a coach, uh, a, a teacher, someone that you look up to and admire, and they just speak kind of a word offhand or out of frustration or someplace, and how that just impacts you in a deep way. Have you ever looked up to somebody, oh, well, thank you, you look up to me, and I say something very stupid, right? Ah, wow, and you see me different, you do that. All of us experience, we've done that, or we've had that experience ourselves. James is reminding us that the power of that small appendage in our mouth called the tongue wields quite a bit of strength. In fact, this image around James that he brings up is this idea of fire, right? Verse 6, the tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body, it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire. There's something very powerful here. In, in fact, what I see this is saying is that there's something in hell that gets ignited often with a word that's very destructive, a word that looks to bring down or to tear down. 
Uh, it, it, it runs wild like a wildfire, devours everything in its path, leaving a wake of destruction. Uh, I was telling somebody before service, Cleve and I were talking, and I had, was in winters, and I drove over back to Napa uh, through past Berryessa, and I hadn't done that in a, a long time, or actually I had never done that, and came over, and all the destruction that is still present from the wildfires that came through that area, some of us remember that. But that doesn't just happen on hillsides, right? This happens, this fire rages in classrooms, in boardrooms, at dining room tables, often it runs uncontrollably. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And to each one of us, we responded, whoa, whoa, whoa. See, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, this new family of faith, hey, you are part of something new. Chapters 1, chapters 2, chapter 3, all these new things of who you are and your identity. This is who you are. And with this idea of being a part of this new family, we also have a new code, a code of how we speak to one another, how we encourage. Yep, the world says this is how you treat employees. This is how you speak uh, to, to vendors. This is on and on it goes. No, this is how we speak to one another in a way that is honoring, that is helpful, that builds one another up. So we put off old speech patterns that have been corrupted, and we put on a new language, a new speaking. My oldest son just got his ears uh, pierced, a bunch of piercings in his ears. Um, And I was thinking, gosh, I I need to get one of those for my tongue, right? (laughs) Just like stick it, because that would help. Now, this is something that I think really is insightful is that the ancient Hebrews saw this great power in words that were spoken. In fact, it was once it was said, there was no taking it back. So even if I did have a net where I could catch my words, it wouldn't do any good because once it was spoken, you can't take it back. As much as I wanted to take it back, as much as we desired to take it back, there was no doing it. In fact, think of the Old Testament story of Isaac blessing Jacob, right? He was the younger son and Isaac wanted to bless the older son, Esau. And Jacob, whole other story, snuck in there, got the blessing. And Esau was so desperate. Oh, give something to me, something. He goes, I can't. I've spoken it. It is done. That's the image. That's the power that that, that words have. There's no way I could take it back. Even if I wanted to, there is, as the scripture says, there is life and death in the tongue. Hmm. I'm Pastor Allen, I'm here to make you feel good about yourself. You know what? Something that was really good was last week. How many of you were here last week and saw that powerful interaction on the stage? I actually stood in the back and I was telling one of the students yesterday, I was moved. I was starting to tear up because of what was happening in this moment. Parents stood up here speaking words of life, words of blessing over their kids. I mean, there's something holy powerful in that moment it's mysterious and i a reminder that man all of us we need to have these words of life spoken over each and every one of us fcc i bless you i honor you i bless you in the ways of grace and love and truth we need that deep deposit in our heart because our culture let's be honest our culture is just not good at speaking words of life this is not part of our culture. I mean, there's so many other things, words that build others up. If I was to ask you, kind of just take an inventory of this week and how many words of life were spoken to you compared to those that were spoken to kind of bring you down, unfortunately, most of us would have a long list of the destructive words. I mean, case in point, how many of you are just like super excited that it's election season is pushing its way in, Right? Oh, man, can we just delve even deeper to a lower rhetoric than what we already have established? I was thinking about this week. I wonder, I mean, what if somebody was brave enough just to stand out and say, I'm not going to speak ill of other parties, other people, other positions. I'm just going to speak of what I believe and what I think is right. I mean, would that person even have a chance of uh, gathering a vote? Some people are like, no, there's no way. 
right? Yeah, because it's so ingrained in our culture. Tear down, tear down, tear down, burn it down, burn it all down. Well, James 1.26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is what? Hmm. That is one of those happy, happy verses. Am I right? Yay. James is like giving us such a strong challenge for uh, disciples. If I'm a follower of Jesus, it means I'm being changed by Jesus. That's the idea of putting off old, putting on new, so that I can be fully committed, fully vested into the mission and the way of Jesus. It's great. In fact, I was peeking in on the encouragers group because I was so curious, is they were talking about the reformer Martin Luther, who I'd just been reading about this week. And uh, when it came to the book of James, he actually made offhanded remarks about it. Uh, calling it a lower part of Scripture. In fact, some commentators say he wanted to cut it out altogether from the Scriptures. Now, he didn't really want to do that, but he just did not see James as of great value. But here's the thing, as we see it, of great value. And there are some tensions with, when we read it and we read Scripture, but what Ephesians is doing for us is bringing us back to this, really, a paradox. Step into this paradox of putting off and putting on, recognizing that it's not by my sheer willpower, but it's by a way power, the way of Jesus at work within me, the way of Jesus continuing to change me from the inside out. That's super important. Often we think, I'm going to change on the outside some external things, but that's willpower. Way power says, Jesus, I surrender. I need you. I'm a mess. <laughs> right? Turn to the person next to you and say, Pastor Allen's a mess. <laughs> One of the things I've been so intrigued by in the last few years is the stories of the desert fathers and mothers. Are you familiar with any of the desert fathers and mothers who lived like in the third, fourth, even fifth century? Uh, powerful believers in Jesus and, and the way of God at work. And what they were known to do was to flee the uh, corruption and the decadence of city life and all the deceitfulness of it. And they made their way out into desolate places, wilderness, desert places, and established these communities, really to save their own souls and to, to be pure in heart with God, but also so they might bring back a word that would build up the church, a word of truth, a word of life that they would speak to the church. There was one specific father um, whose name was Abba Agathon. What a great name, huh? Abba Agathon. And uh, it was said of Abba Agathon that he, for three years he took a stone and placed it in his mouth. For three years. <laughs> so that he might learn to be silent because without silence there is no hope to have words that would build others up. Now, I don't have a bucket of rocks to pass out today. Not a bad idea. Uh, this one's mine, so get your own. Um, but I do have a couple simple steps that I have been trying to infuse in our community over this last year. These things have been helping me to live out the Scripture, not just to read the Scripture, not just to study the Scripture, but to truly live it deep within the deep places of my heart, uh, that I would not be deceived by this cultural moment that we are in. Friends, we're living in a moment that is very easy to be deceived. And I'm not talking at the extreme ends of culture. I'm talking right even in religious context, to be deceived and to think that following Jesus means this when it means something very different. And so learning to do that. I'm, now, I want to confess that I am not an expert. I'm not the perfect man that James refers to. But I have a deep conviction that comes from a theological understanding and I think from a very practical place of how do I live this out? How do I walk in a way that follows and honors Jesus? So here's, um, here's what I'd say. If you're taking notes, here's my two helpful tips. Pastor tips here, right? First one is simply this. Pause. I mean, you can't even say pause without kind of like slowing it down, right? Pause. In other words, you find yourself in a conversation and you feel that urge to say something stupid. Pause. Now, that honestly might be, hey, hey, I need to excuse myself for a moment, go to the restroom. You know, honestly, I have done that a number of times. I need to quick take a quick walk. I just need to like, I just need to time out. 
right? I can feel myself doing that. I can feel the blood pressure rising in me. In fact, I got an alarm that tells me my blood pressure is uh, getting ready to go off the chart. I've got that adrenaline dump. Have you felt that, that fight or flight? Too often I want to fight. Now, I know there's a couple fighters in here. You're kind of nodding at me. Yep, you'd love to fight. Yep, uh, take me to lunch. I'll fight all day. Um, <clears throat> Or flight, and I, honestly, sometimes I want to do that. I just want to run away and just get out of here, right, because I just don't want to deal with it, right? Pause. Everybody say it. Pause. Because what pause does is it gives your body physically a break of what's going on, what's happening. It lets your mind just kind of gather itself in a moment. And most important, what it does is that your spirit gives you an opportunity for your spirit to connect with Holy Spirit. And how you do that is simple. Just allow some silence to come in over you. And in that silence, it's not a matter of, okay, I'm just complaining. Oh, oh, we call that prayer uh, to God. But rather, I'm just being silent in this moment that Jesus is here, that he knows. I mean, he really knows. Even if I think I know, he, he really knows what's going on. And I'm just silent. And, I, and I'm training myself to worship God in that moment. And maybe it's like just a 30-second count. I mean, if that's it's new to you, just start there, 30 seconds, right? And just be silent. If we're honest, most of us scorn silence. We despise it, right? It's because we've been so formed, we've been so conditioned by the noise around us. Are you uncomfortable with just silence even when you're by yourself? I am. Uh, we, we just, the, the noise outside of us, which too often becomes the noise inside of us. And so again, not being in a culture that values silence, it is a narrow road to say, I'm gonna choose to pause and slow down and just be with Jesus. And it's simple. It's just things like, man, God, you are good. And you just might repeat that for a minute or two. God, you're good. God, you are good. You're good, God. You are always good. And it's just something simple where it's an act of worship uh, with the Lord. I know for me, this is what it looks like, kind of this daily training is to simply pause. And it's not just kind of one time in the day, but throughout my day that I'm taking one. Sometimes if I have a meeting or, or a, a project that I know is just going to be intense, I'm just going to take some time and just pause and simply be kind of two minutes of silence, read the word, just a couple verses even, and then just kind of cap it again with a couple minutes of silence. Just that simple process in that simple way. Now, what's the fruit of that? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, my irritability quotient is actually decreasing. And I'm starting to recognize quicker that I'm getting to that place where, oh, man, I need to take a time out. I need to put myself uh, on a little time out. And my words are becoming much more wholesome much more helpful for building others up. In fact, last night I could feel myself, and part of it was hunger. My wife knew immediately, ah, hunger is uh, kicking in because if I just get into this, ah, and, and it's all over me. I mean, it's not just my words, but even my mannerisms. And, oh. Pastor Allen's a mess. Did you turn to somebody and tell that? Nah, Pastor Allen's a mess. Here's what I'm discovering. My pace of life, Valerie, I love that, that note that you made about fast-paced life. I mean, boy, I preach it, sister. Um, I have this natural fast pace within me, but what I'm discovering over these last couple years is that that causes me to run on fumes. And when I start to run on fumes, that's when it starts to get ugly, right? I am quicker with the sharp tongue remarks. I'm quicker with my destructive speech, patterns, habits. Uh, it's just, it's not good. And so what I'm recognizing is this, this need to pause, just be with. Be with Jesus. I have this growing conviction, in fact, that I'm calling all of our leaders into this way of life. This powerful, it's very different than you see. In fact, I would confess, it's very different in many churches. But it is, I think, a way of Jesus in this ancient practice that Jesus demonstrated in his life, this, this daily rhythm of just simply being with Jesus. Because here's the truth. What we do is important, 
some of your teachers, you're in business, you're in um, environments where you're working with people. What you do is super important, but listen, who we are is way more important. That's why Proverbs is such a powerful tool, and that's why I've been trying to instill this into us over those, uh, this last year to continue to live out these healthy rhythms in our lives, to follow this way of Jesus in a very true, practical, everyday way so that we might overflow with the love of God, so that when we share with others, we share words that are life. And that's why I want to bring you back to Proverbs. Here's a couple Proverbs to, to grab onto. Proverbs 10, 19. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, right? Here's my commentary. Stop digging the, dit, the hole for yourself, right? But the prudent hold their tongues. Proverbs 17, 28, I've used this one often in my life. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. There's that, that pierce thing is coming in, right? Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Here's a couple questions that I want to ask myself and maybe you would ask yourself. Are my words helpful? I mean, even more so, are my words even necessary? Do I even need to speak in this situation? Right? Some of us, we're so uncomfortable with the silence, we feel like we've got to vo- you know, fill the void of all the silence, we're learning to be comfortable in the silence. Right? Are my words helpful? Are my words necessary? And if you feel like I need to speak, then the second question that follows that is simply this. Are my words grace-filled, seasoned with truth? Are my words grace-filled, seasoned with truth? In other words, do they build others up according to their needs, as Ephesians said? Two great questions. Now, here's the test. Here's the test. This is going to be a stretch for some of us. Here's the test. You're in a conversation with somebody, and they say something heretical. Yep, and I'm putting that in quotes, heretical, right? What is your immediate response Are you ready to pounce? I'm going to straighten you out, brother. I'm bringing both barrels of truth to you. Can I have you consider something? Maybe just pause for a second. Just pause. Holy Spirit, right? Jesus, help me. Right? Right in that moment, pause. And do the second application point. Ponder. Pause. Ponder. Right? Right? In other words, someone says something, you think, ah, oh, interesting. I wonder why they think that. That's interesting. I wonder how they came to that conclusion rather than feeling like you got to fix them. Any fixers? You got a tool belt, walking around, only a tool in it is by a hammer, right? A little too close to home, I'm sorry. That's at least what my tool belt looks like, right? It's fascinating how the most articulate intellectual people can quickly revert to some of the most debased playground type of speech. Like that. Like that. That's why I said we live in a culture that's so deceptive, so easily get entangled in that. And this is the challenge because for many of us, our family of origin, the families that we grew up in, the background, it was kind of like say anything, say everything, say it all the time. Anything that comes to mind without any filters, just acknowledge it, say it out there. All systems go. Anybody like that? No one's raising their hand. (laughs) One in the back. There you go. That's why Proverbs is such a major, this major theme about being prudent. Prudent. I'm thinking that might be a good tattoo for me. Prudence, pastor. And what Proverbs says is that some are prudent and some are fools. They give no thought to their ways or their words, right? It's like the fine print. How many of you just love to read the fine print? You got to sign a lease, a contract. Lease or contract. Jill, this is where this illustration comes from. She handed me a lease that we had signed recently, and I was looking at that, and I was thinking, I've got no time to read this. I've got things to do. I've got places to be. And then I'm reading it and going, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe that is in there. I had no idea. Oh, I, cheats. I will never do business with them again. Now, it was, that's a little calm compared to what Jill witnessed. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I was, I was on my best behavior in the office. Proverbs 29, 20, do you see someone who speaks in haste, signs a contract in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Hmm. Proverbs 14, 
verse 8, wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is what? Deception. Here's one that maybe you can relate to. Maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one that's like this, sitting at the computer, keyboard, bing, email comes in, and it's really critical. It's very unfair. It's very biased, very incorrect in what this person is saying. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, how, how do you respond? What, do you respond in haste? Pro tip, right? Pastor tip. Pause. Ponder for a moment. Maybe that's a 24-hour moment. Now, I would say it may be super helpful to type something out and just go for it, write it out, whatever it is, how it gets that thought, gets that up out of you, right? That can be really helpful. But before you hit send, pause. Ponder. Okay, I'm going to just let this rest with the Lord for a little bit. Often what God directs me to do is to actually hit delete and to say, hey, can we get together for a conversation? There's a few folks that I've done that often with, and I think they've stopped sending me emails. Um, James says, no one can tame the tongue. That also applies to fingers and thumbs. You see something on Twitter. Someone says something on social media. Someone sends you an email pause, ponder. In fact, pastor's pro tip is never respond via electronic messaging. It's always worth a conversation. It's much harder. That's why we're growing up. That's why we're maturing. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Some people don't listen. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Friends, that is a good word for us to pause on today. And just to ponder that as we go about this week and about the next days. And so I want to invite our worship team to come up and lead us in a closing song. That really is a prayer to do this and to live this out. And as they're doing that, I want to ask you to consider something. And here's the consideration. There's probably one person in your life that just has a powerful way of bringing out the old in you. You know who they are, right? Can you think about them? Everybody's got one. If you need one, I have got one. <laughs> There's somebody like that, and you're probably going to interact with them this week, maybe even today. Here's what I would encourage you to consider. Have a meeting with Jesus before meeting with them. Yeah, and it's simply applying this, this truth today, this pause, this ponder way of thinking and it may go something like this. You just take a two minutes, you just kind of quiet yourself, you just worship God, just declare how great he is. You read just a few of these Proverbs. You didn't write them down, it's okay. See me after, I'll let you get them down. I'll send them to you. Just let those speak deep to your heart and then just wait on that. Another couple minutes, you're just with Jesus. And as you, before you finish, just offer to the Lord this moment. And it may go something like this. Lord, you know, I'm meeting with, say there, their name, and they're probably going to say something like, and I always respond like, and so Lord, now I confess. It's key. It's key. I confess that I need your holy fire to refine me. I need your holy fire to restore, renew, to mature me so that I might speak with words of grace and truth, love and life. And you say amen. In fact, let me have you stand. This is not about being perfect. We've put that off. But it is about putting on maturity. And as a follower of Jesus, that's what he calls us to, is to mature. To not get old, but like I said last week, to grow up. We're not getting old, but we are growing up 
in Jesus and to be aware of how much we need his presence day by day and moment by moment. So Father, let's just pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace. Oh, how good it is, how sweet it is. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Jesus. Thanks again for joining us for today's message from First Christian Church. If you'd like to take a step in your faith and connect with a staff member at FCC, visit fccnapa.org slash connect. To stay up to date on things going on in the FCC community, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the FCC Napa YouTube channel. Have a great day.